I'm Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday Monday Mindset Mindset Podcast, Podcast. where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 180. Back to the bingo caller again. (laughs) And this week it's Terry's turn to share something with us. Terry, what do you have? Well, Daisy, you may have noticed from a message that I sent you earlier today that I was preparing this morning and I was listening to a couple of different things and then of course, oh, that doesn't really work out and then I found something else that I was really interested in, but she was saying something I thought, no, I know Daisy has said this before and I went back and it's (laughs) someone that both you and I had both already presented on. So I thought, okay, even though this is a different episode, I'm going to let it go. So then, of course, I needed to find something that I could do pretty quickly. So Jim Quick to the rescue, quick brain. And I will admit... He probably has to be one of our absolute favorites, doesn't he, on this podcast? Absolutely. (laughs) Probably the most used. (laughs) That's right. So... I will admit, I chose a topic when I was scrolling through that is very self-serving. So I hope everyone will just tolerate me doing this because this really was for me today because I need this reminder. So this is from Quick Brain. It's episode 351 called Beyond Brushing. Optimize your oral health for brain performance with Dr. Dominic Nischwitz. Interesting. So we're going to talk just a little bit about our oral health. And I have a long history of um, when I was a kid, I would be the one who would lie and figure out ways to pretend that I had brushed my teeth when I really hadn't. But surprisingly, I've never had a cavity. Wow. Yeah. So <laughs> that does not seem fair. <laughs> I know. I know. It's injustice at, at its heart. And then I went for a period of time. I was a teacher in my early career. So I had good health insurance and dental insurance. And then I went back to grad school and had no insurance, no dental insurance. I didn't go to the dentist for 10 years. Now, anyone that I work with that is a dentist is probably horrified at this point. But I came back 10 years later, the people cleaning my teeth and doing the x-rays are like, oh my gosh, your teeth are great. Look at this. <laughs> In not such a pleasant way, I said, well, I guess that going to the dentist once a year or every six months was a lie, huh? But what I have found as I continue to age is that I am having some issues with dental hygiene and care. And I do brush my teeth now, unlike when I was a kid, I, I don't lie about it now, but I don't floss. And so that is one of the lectures that I get every time I go to the dentist. So I thought, well, I want to hear what this person has to say and learn a little bit more about this. And for me, being oral hygiene and about my teeth is really important, but you connect it to brain health and I'm going to start listening a little more. Mm. So I thought this is a podcast that I need to listen to and hopefully one that will be useful for other people as well. Yes, I wouldn't have ever thought of that connection. I always, you know me, I always make it about the dogs. But I know how important it is with the dogs to have decent oral health because one of my mum's dogs actually, I got something, like it's always, it was it ears eyes and throat or ears nose and throat everything's around there is connected and he got a really bad infection I think maybe in his eyes or his ears and it was down to his teeth and from that day forward they started brushing his teeth that was an evening routine and he was fine moving forwards and my dogs since they started eating raw have actually been really good with their teeth apart from rocket and he's the one who least likes me messing around Uh with things like that but he does actually now let me brush his teeth and i've seen a big improvement it all comes down to the taste of the toothpaste apparently he really likes the toothpaste so he lets me do it but i suppose it's self-serving to an extent but you always see these adverts about the importance of 
dogs having clean teeth and mm -hmm. so but I never would have associated it with brain health so yeah. I'm really fascinated to hear this yeah so one of the unique things about the dentist that he was speaking to is that he is I don't remember his actual qualifications but he does what would be referred to as natural dentistry and so Jim Quick asked him just to explain briefly what that entails and he said that it's really kind of the combination of functional medicine and health optimization. He said, you know, when you go to dental school, really you are there to learn about smiles. And I can't remember the other way he said it, but basically you learn to fix teeth. Mm. What he does now is really about seeing your teeth as an extension of your health rather than I'm going to fix your smile, I'm going to fix this broken tooth or something. Um, it's not just about fillings and, you know, fixing how they look. It's actually about paying attention to how they're affecting your health. So this really caught my attention. So he talked about the fact that, you know, as many of us know, we have 12 cranial nerves. And number five is the one that is connected to our teeth. And interestingly, that cranial nerve takes up about 50% of the space of all 12 nerves. So wow. it's obviously a pretty significant one. And it ends in kind of three points, your lower jaw, your upper jaw, and then up to like your eyebrow. And at the end of this are your teeth. And so really seeing your teeth as part of your full extension of your brain and seeing mm. that it does connect directly with your brain. He talked about the fact that we might have a root canal done and, and we see that one root, but that one tooth root is actually somewhere between 30 to 75,000 dental tubules. So openings that allow things in and transmit information and to just kind of put this in another way that's about six tenths of a mile of surface wow in one hmm. tooth Amazing. root so a lot of information coming in and out through your teeth and and again access to the brain so he talked a little bit about an analogy of um, your teeth if you kind of think of them almost like plants. If you don't feed your plants, and I know you've been talking about, you and I have been talking a little bit about your plants because of the season changing and bringing them indoors or not, but if you don't feed a plant properly, it is malnourished and it withers and it doesn't survive. Mm. Same thing with our teeth. So it's not just damage to our teeth that things do, but it's actually the lack of minerals and nourishment that our teeth need that really have to do with how vibrant they are, how alive tissue that they are. I can remember the lady I used to, sadly, her shop is closed down, one of my favorite shops. I bought a lot of houseplants from her. She was horrified when she discovered that I wasn't feeding my houseplants. <laughs> so it's a perfect analogy for me. I actually had this one plant. And uh, if you do hear bangs in the background, that's because it is bonfire night here and there are fireworks going off everywhere, which is why I also have a quivering rocket on the sofa behind me. Um, but yes, I had this one plant, Phylodendron silver sword, if anyone's interested, that I thought had these quite small leaves. And then when I started feeding it baby bio, <laughs> the leaves were about five times the size. It's like, oh, <laughs> that's why you're supposed to feed your house plants. <laughs> yeah, if they get all of those nutrients they're supposed to have, they're yeah. really vibrant. Same thing with our teeth. So he then really kind of dives into rather than just behaviors like we all get taught how often we should brush how to brush and floss of course and this was the thing that i struggle to do i have tried so many times to make it a challenge to get myself to floss and then i do it for like three days and then i stop so it's the james clear example isn't it yeah. floss one tooth at a time <laughs> yeah I, I gotta admit i don't even floss one so 
he said, you know, this this does get into some controversial kind of information because, again, this goes against what he learned in dental school because dental school was just, here are the behaviors, here's how you take care of teeth, and then dentist, you go in and fix them. But he talked about the importance of vitamin D. He said, if you have, you know, tooth decay, guarantee you probably do not have enough vitamin D, that this mm. is a major component of health of your teeth and that that also has the cofactor of K2 and so those are really important. He talked about the importance of magnesium supplementation. For most of us we don't get enough magnesium in our food. He also talked about some other minerals and things, zinc and boron and things. And then he said the biggest and most important really is protein and the amino acids, not just the essential amino acids, but amino acids that we get um, that this is super important. And he did go through some tips on how much protein and based on our connection initially, Daisy, and talking about low carb or keto, and then my work now with fasting, I'm not going to get into the details of how much protein, but just the idea that getting adequate protein and not just on the low end, but enough protein really can make a big difference to the health of your teeth and your whole oral cavity. So again, this is where the more controversial stuff comes in, but he recommends that the things you use on your teeth should not be abrasive because it it is a, you know, a, um, a surface that can be abused and then will become more vulnerable. And he said that our toothpaste should not have toxins in it. So he recommends fluoride free, There's another chemical that is in most toothpaste that he talks about not having. So using things in your mouth that are not toxic and not abrasive and also that don't have sugar because we don't want to be adding Mm -hmm. sugar into that environment. He also then talked about if you're going to use a mouthwash or a rinse, it also should not be Um, super chemically laden. So if you really go back and you look at, he mentioned one that um, the way he put it is like the most popular mouthwash here in the U.S. starts with an L. I won't say what it is, but it actually can work as floor cleaner. It's so toxic and abrasive. That makes sense because the feeling it leaves in your mouth, it feels like your mouth's been scoured, which you you come to associate because you buy into all the ads and stuff that that's a good way that that's clean yeah but this is where I think the natural dentistry piece for me becomes so important Mm. because our oral microbiome that's not easy for me to say our oral microbiome is the most diversified portion of of our biome our microbiome in our body and it's as significant and second just to our gut biome so It is the other place where all of this bacteria and things are really necessary. So when we basically put a napalm bomb in our mouth by, you know, using this mouthwash or this toothpaste, it's actually wiping out that bacteria Mm, in our oral microbiome. So it's killing the bacteria that we actually need to balance things and to digest properly and get everything going. Damage to our oral microbiome and gum disease is directly linked to brain health. So again, this is where I started listening. It's like, okay, Mm. I keep being told I've got gum disease. I had to have a surgery procedure to try to repair some gum. So we talked about the idea that some people may be up on this a little bit in our gut biome, but you hear something referred to as leaky gut, where there are kind of holes that are created and then nutrients and things go into spaces where they're not supposed to be. Well, this happens in our mouth as well. So oral pathogens can then cause microglial cells in the brain which cause neural inflammation. Inflamed brain is not a brain that's working well. No. So these pieces getting in through our, our microbiome in our, in our mouth can actually go to our brain. And he said, you know, if you think of your gums, almost like you look at your skin, like your skin keeps things in or out. 
this is what your gums do. And when we have gum disease or receding gums or whatnot, they're not able to keep that barrier safe. And so we are at much greater risk of oral issues, but also, and this might be something as you talked about with the dogs, cardiovascular damage that's done by things, you know, gone into our system from our mouth, but also, as I said, for the brain. So he really just emphasized again, the importance of not using toxic substances in our mouthwash or toothpaste, using a soft brush. You know, some of us basically, it's like getting in there with a Mm -hmm. uh, steel wool and scrubbing at our mouth. And he really does not recommend that. And then focusing on the, the food that we eat specifically in getting enough protein and then supplementing those things. So obviously in a really short episode, he can't go into all of the details. So he is also a best-selling author of a book called It's All in Your Mouth, Biological Dentistry and the Surprising Impact of Oral Health on Whole Body Wellness. So just in case anyone's looking for a little a more. mouthful. <laughs> yeah, it is a mouthful. <laughs> in case anyone's looking for a little light reading before bed, this book may work. But I, I think for me, this was just a, another reminder that I want to take care of my oral health not just so that I don't have dentists giving me a hard time when I go to my appointment, but I want to protect my brain. I want to protect my gut biome. And so taking care of my mouth and my oral microbiome is really going to be helpful for overall health. And I'm not going to focus so much on the fact that I'm not flossing. I'm going to work on these other things. So one of the other strategies that he talked about is one that I used to do pretty regularly and haven't done for a couple of years. So I'm going to bring this practice back and that is oil pulling with coconut oil. Um, Obviously it's not abrasive, it's very mild, you're not using a scouring tool or anything, but it really gets in there. It's antimicrobial, it's antibacterial, antifungal. So I'm going to bring back my practice of coconut oil pulling and see what difference that makes even though I'm not going to pick up flossing all of the time. I'm still going to work on my flossing but I'm not going to kind of hold that over myself as the end all be all of oral health care that I really need to do some other things to protect my teeth, my gut and my brain. I think it probably depends on the individual to a degree with flossing. I mean I reach for my dental floss pretty much as soon as I've eaten because it must be something to do with the gaps in my teeth. Food gets stuck there and I can Mm -hmm. feel it and it's uncomfortable. So that's my motivation to floss because it's uncomfortable and I want to get it Mm -hmm. out. (laughs) So it's, you know, it's something that I actively want to do as soon as I've eaten really. But I guess if that's not a problem, then there isn't that motivation. I know there are those other things, aren't there? Those little sort of like mini toilet brush things that you can press in between. It's all about cleaning out the gaps between mm-hmm. the teeth, isn't it, basically? Did he have anything to say about flossing? Um, He didn't. My takeaway from it was just that flossing is not actually necessary as long as you are doing something that is, like you're saying, removing some of this mm. stuff. Because what happens with my teeth, unfortunately, is the calcification that just forms around the teeth. And so I think by doing some flossing and being more active with my oil pulling, I'm hoping to alleviate that. He didn't go into any detail about flossing or frequency or anything. He just kind of glossed it over as not one of the most important things that you could be doing as long as you're doing these other things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, more the preventative nature. Mm -hmm. I should imagine most dentists would prefer a low or no sugar diet. I mean, that's a no brainer. There's no contesting the fact that sugar is not good for teeth. So I imagine they're all for that. But yeah, there's some some really interesting things there. It makes me want to immediately throw out certainly my mouthwash. The only problem I have with toothpaste and switching to natural toothpaste, and I do see adverts often you know what it's like anytime you've looked up anything natural, you get all the natural alternatives for all sorts of things. And I've ended up with various different products that are 
a natural form alternative. But the one thing that they don't seem to cater for are people with sensitive teeth. And that's something that I have noticed a really big difference in using a toothpaste that is for sensitive teeth. I do feel the benefits of that. You know, like if I've gone away or something and, and haven't taken a toothpaste with me, I feel that I, I see a big increase in the sensitivity hmm. in my teeth, which is obviously not a good thing. So that for me personally would make it difficult to make the swap unless they bring something. It's probably some kind of chemical, I guess, that is the <laughs> the sensitivity bit, which is why it's difficult. Because I suppose all you're doing when you're cleaning your teeth is cleaning your teeth. You don't, you know, all these other things that they sell it on, like... You know, they quite often say it does seven different things, like it whitens and it does this and it does that. All those are basically chemicals. You're really just wanting to clean your teeth. Now, I don't know this, but just based on what you just described and what he described and what I've been thinking about this is, I wonder if you are not using toothpaste that have these other harsh things in mm, it that's true if yeah. you eventually won't need to be buffering the sensitivity if if that might eventually balance out if you're using something and if you are again focusing on the supplements or nourishing your teeth in whatever way maybe the sensitivity won't be as common for you because maybe the sensitivity is partly from all of the things that we've been taught mm -hmm. to do to our teeth. Yeah, that's a good point. And you mentioned the oil pulling, which I've certainly, I've, I've tried it myself and I've, I've read about. Um, the other thing that came to my mind with a, as a natural mouthwash is salt water. And that's, I mean, that's actually what the dentist recommended, well, said that I had to do after I had a tooth pulled out was to not really vigorously like a mouthwash, but just let it loosely mm -hmm. um, rinse around as because it's a natural antiseptic, isn't it? So uh, that I guess would, would be an alternative mouthwash as well would be to use salt water. Again, it, it, it's that and the oil pulling, it's the action like you were saying, potentially that could be an alternative depending mm -hmm. on how your teeth are. Like I say, stuff always gets stuck in mine. So I, I seem to really need it. But the oil pulling is is a way of cleaning, isn't it? Cleaning the gaps. It's that action of pulling it through the gaps in your teeth. So, yes, that sounds like that might be <laughs> the alternative that you can get away with. It's an interesting thing with the sensitivity. The other uh, note that I made at the beginning when you were talking about the link and the far reaching effect and all the and the nerve endings in particular and it made me think of two things one of those was that babies often sort of use their mouth they sort of test things with their mouths often don't they and puppies do it as well of course <laughs> mm -hmm. but is that putting things in their mouth and testing it i wonder if there's some kind of link there with a a way to sort of gauge something sometimes use your mouth that's just something that came to mind an uh, interesting question but the other thing that i have a real problem with and i think to a certain extent i inherited from my father because he has the same thing he has a very hard bite so he tends to get fractures in his teeth and i have the same and also really bad grinder of teeth and so i did get a a really fancy tooth guard made shows how good it was actually it was sent off and made in Canada over gosh I think it's something like 25 years old and it's now in two pieces but he said it would last for a long time and it sure has but it you know it's one that sits um, but it's perfectly formed to my bottom teeth and it doesn't stop me grinding my teeth obviously but it stops any more damage unfortunately I wasn't given that until I actually had quite a lot of damage on my teeth. And you can see quite clearly the damage that has been done. And that probably feeds into the sensitivity because it has worn down in a lot of places, that protective layer. But it just made me think of that link that you were talking about. You know, you, you tend to grind your teeth and clench your teeth. It's a stress thing, isn't it? And working out, presumably working out that stress in your sleep. So I can, you know, really see these connections that you haven't necessarily thought of before. But 
yeah, underestimating the, the reach of your teeth and the health of your mouth. Very interesting. And I think for me, I knew some of these things from some previous trainings I've attended and things, but just that reinforcement that, again, what we've been taught along the way might not be what's best for us, that there might be some alternative ways to approach this. And, you know, again, he's a dentist. He is going against the grain by even suggesting some of these things. But again, his focus is not just on, do you have a smile that works? And do you have how many false teeth do you have? But he's really concerned about what implications all of this has for your health. And so, as I said, for me, the making the connection to the brain health, I think is a new level of motivation for me to really refocus on addressing my oral health care for longevity and, and overall health. Yeah, and it's interesting where you mentioned the vitamin D. I mean, vitamin D is so important for so many things, isn't it? But I immediately thought of that calcium connection. And if the if the D and the and the K2 and the magnesium aren't right, you know, the calcium can not go to the right places. And obviously calcium is important in teeth. So yeah, really interesting. Interestingly, my first appointment with my orthopedic surgeon from my injury, I asked him, what is, are there any supplements or anything I should do that would be helpful in bone repair? And he said the most important thing he would recommend is vitamin D3. Mm. And I already take a pretty high dose of that. So I've been making sure that that's been real consistent during my recovery um, because he said that's going to be the most indicative of, you know, strengthening my my bone growth. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, before we sign off, how's that going? I, I, I mean, I know we chat, so I, I know you're in much less pain these yeah. days, but... Just just a quick share with our listeners who might be wondering how your recovery is going. I'm doing very well. Um, I'm no longer wearing my sling, um, not even sleeping in it. So um, really back to normal movement. I still have a little bit limited range of movement, motion or mobility in that shoulder, but it's improving. The ribs are still a little sensitive. I can still feel them when I sneeze, but I don't. <laughs> almost start crying when I'm going to have to sneeze because of the first week or two that was that was enough to kind of send me but I'm um, doing very well thanks for checking in on that that sounds good it sounds like you're on target to be on those slopes I was just gonna say because the... you know we're gonna have to talk about <laughs> ski season soon absolutely <laughs> <laughs> well that sounds good until next time I hope you have a very wonderful week Take good care, everybody. Bye.